Um, hello, uh, my name's John Leach. I'm from uh, Brightbox. We're a, a Leeds-based cloud infrastructure uh, provider. We've got data centers in Manchester, so we're uh, UK-owned and UK-operated. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a bit about Docker. Uh, how many people have heard of Docker? Trick question you all have. <laughs> um, how many people are using it for something? Okay, quite a few. Is anyone using it for anything important? Oh, almost the same number of people. Um, <coughs> okay, so that's good. Um, if you want to interrupt at any time, if you've got any questions or anything, uh, or you could just shout your board maybe and I'll move on to, next, on to the next slide, that's fine. So if you've got any questions, stick your hand up or interrupt if you fancy. Um, I don't mind that. Um, so I want to talk a bit about what Docker is, but I know the audience, and so I'm more, I am more—I know that you're more interested in the kind of guts of it, what's going on behind the scenes a little bit. So I'll try and talk about what problems it's trying to solve, but also how it's solving them. Um, because if nothing else, even if you don't use Docker, a lot of the technologies that it uses are quite interesting and are useful in other scenarios. Um, so I'm going to try and demystify it. Um, I'm an old school sysadmin at heart. Uh, but I'm always happy to play with new technology like Docker, but I'm suitably pessimistic and curmudgeonly. So uh, I'm sure I've been looking at it with a, with a pessimistic inner eye. <coughs> but you can decide for yourself whether you think I've drunk the Kool-Aid or not. Um, so when a developer's developing, when they're writing some code, they have to have in mind the platform that the code is going to run on. Um, they have to have some kind of idea where it's going to run. Um, 15 years ago, that was a pretty simple platform, right? It was probably LAMP, you know, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Um, there was pretty much one version of PHP, and it was everywhere, and it ran and worked just the same. And there was one version of MySQL, and it ran everywhere, and it behaved exactly the same, badly. Um, uh, Apache would spawn your script, give it an environment with details about the request, and, you know, PHP knew how to make use of that, do the right thing. Um, how did developers develop PHP in those days? Personally, I, was, I think I was still using a Windows desktop at the time, and I'm pretty certain I wasn't running PHP on Windows. Um, my recollection was I would edit my PHP file and save it and FTP it up to the server and then load it in my browser and see if it loaded properly. Um, often that would be a production server, <laughs> um, which is what we nowadays we call that continuous deployment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, so eventually I moved on to something a little bit more sophisticated where I would have um, a local dev environment on a virtual server. Obviously this was 15 years ago, so by virtual server I meant a collection of bits of components that I could virtually call a server um, as opposed to an actual virtualization system. Uh, and I would upload to that and load it on there, make sure it worked on there first before uploading it to, um, uh, to my production server. So it looked a bit like this, didn't it? You know, we had Actually, I just nicked this diagram off the internet, and I don't know who made this in what order it's supposed to be. But anyway, LAMP, there we are. It was nice and simple. We knew we could get it up and running on our local dev server, and it was easy to do. Goal, go on one server. But, you know, in the, over the last 15 years, we've added a queuing service, background workers. You know, we've rewritten half of the PHP in Java and added some mail relays and a memcache server, and written the other half in uh, Ruby. Uh, added a MongoDB cluster for some reason, removed the MongoDB cluster for obvious reasons. Uh, WebSocket service, uh, all that kind of stuff is now, this stack is just growing and growing and growing. And uh, it's just changed dramatically. It's moved from something like this to something far more akin to this kind of thing. Um, and that's a lot harder to reproduce on your local dev server. Um, and even if you can, keeping it like your production environment is hard too. Even just slight different versions of libraries and things nowadays can really change how things work and how things work and how things run. Um, so how do we model this kind of architecture? How do we, how do we test against it? Um, so actual virtualization is a thing now where we can, on our local dev server, we can run lots of little servers on there and maybe emulate this kind of environment. Um, it's got a few problems though. Uh, and we're making progress as an industry, but it's still pretty clunky getting up you know, 10 virtual machines to emulate something, getting them booted up and, and running is hard work to begin with. It's just time, if nothing else, having to wait for them. Um, but there's also 
wiring them all together with some kind of networking thing and then getting your app onto all those virtual machines and deploying it and, and then knowing how to make the requests to it to test it and so on. There's a, there's a lot going on. It's quite hard to do with virtualization. Um, and the idea of doing that on your local dev laptop, you know, 10 virtual machines on there is probably not going to happen. Um, the tool set for making those images with Eco is pretty cumbersome too. So this is what the problem that I think Docker is trying to solve. Um, it's trying to make virtualization be something that we can model these types of big complex systems a lot more quickly, a lot more conveniently, and ideally on our local systems, on our local laptops where we're doing the development. Um, so as it says, it aims to describe, it aims to describe this kind of environment. Um, it's the format in which you package your app. Um, the idea is you would make it work on your local dev system, and then that exact des description and binaries essentially would then run on your dev system and on your test system, and then eventually in production. So the exact same binary bits are running in production as we're, as we're running and worked on the dev's laptop. Um, so we're, we're, we're looking here to empower developers, um, give them some of this hard, hard work. <laughs> um, but anyway, so the quick overview of Docker, but I'm going to then jump right down to the bottom of how this virtualization is working and what Docker's, these technologies that Docker's using, and I'm going to kind of build up the layers, and then we'll get back to Docker. Um, but I'm going to get a drink before I... These aren't just for show, are they, right? <laughs> Um, who knows about Linux namespaces? Oh, just a few, a little. Okay, um, I find this way more interesting than all the Docker stuff, but Docker's, <laughs> Docker's a bit more exciting. Um, and, the, and Linux namespaces are a pretty boring name. It's the, the hype doesn't really work for it. And uh, So anyway, kernels already isolate processes, right? You run two processes and they, uh, well, <laughs> modern kernels, they can't write into each other's memory spaces. Um, they can't crash each other, that kind of stuff. Um, you can run them as different users on a system, and that separates them uh, a bit further. And you can use permissions to separate their files. Uh, Linux namespaces takes that kind of process isolation and just goes yeah, a thousand times more. It's like um, real control over the isolation of processes running on a system. Um, it's essentially lightweight process virtualization. Um, each process or group of processes gets its own view of the network, gets of the, of the network interfaces, gets its own view of the uh, mounts on the system, and even user IDs and group IDs and mappings. Um, and it can even have its own view of the process list and host name, stuff like that. So from the pr processes point of view, it, it thinks it might, it may, it may think it's the only process running on the system. Um, doesn't know about anything else on there. Um, we'll go through the different are the main namespaces that are available. Uh, quick note on this unshare command. Unshare is a little binary that lets you uh, fork a process, or set up some the namespaces that we're going to describe here and fork a process inside those namespaces. And I'm just going to use it here to keep uh, uh, forking a bash shell so we can then look at the environment that we've created. You know? So uh, in all these examples, bash will be running in these namespaces, and I'll be using the unshare command to do that. And unshare should be installed. And if you've got a modern kernel and a modern, modern Linux, you'll have unshare on there. Um, I mean, un unshare is just the user space interface to the uh, system calls for creating forking processes in, in namespaces. Um, so the mount namespace. Uh, it's a bit like Chirrut, but again, times a million. Um, you the process gets its own view of the file system. So it starts off with a view of uh, the file system mount. Sorry, it gets its own view of the file system mount. So it starts off with seeing all the same mounts as, if, like in, if in this example here, we're going to, uh, I've got a directory called foo, and I ls it, and you can see that it's empty. I run unshare, tell unshare I want to fork a bash process in, in its own mount namespace. Um, nothing's changed at this point. I've just got a bash process in, in its own namespace. Um, and they're going to mount the root file system onto that food directory, the bind mount, just, just, to make, just to make it change, essentially. <coughs> and then I can ls the food directory. You can see all the files from my root file system are now in that food directory. If I exit that bash shell, which is exiting the namespace, uh, the food directory is empty. Will you be making the slides available? 
I will. I'll make this slides available. Yeah. Um, a lot of them are just text at the top, but there's some examples of these. So, um, what you can't see from this is that the whole time, all the other processes on the system, they none of those saw this new mount, and none of them were affected by this mount. Got another question? Oh, just do you have to be root to use on chat? Um, no. Uh, there's a there's there's a couple of um, cases where you don't. I'm going to I'm going to cover those in a moment. Um, so. Yeah, so at, at no point, any of the processors on the, net, on the system, if they looked in that food directory, it would just be empty. There was no, and if it did, they looked in the proc um, mounts file, no new, no new mounts, no mounts differences. Uh, I've just given a simple example here, but you can remount, you can pivot the whole root, you know, pivot mount to a completely different root file system. So you could have a, this is, this is where you can start to see where you have these, you can virtualize a system just by doing the process virtualization. Um, and again, well, you can see it because I'm using ALS, which is technically a child process of bash. You know, the child process, all the ch children of the process in the namespace kind of inherit the namespace. Uh, there's a network namespace. So I'm uh, listing my network interfaces here. I've got ETH0 and a wireless thing and some, a couple of VPNs and things like that. I run unshare at the bottom here, if you can see that. I run unshare to uh, start a bash prompt in a net network namespace. And when I run IP link in there, then I only get an, a loopback adapter. I can't see any other adapters. I can create new tunnels. I can call tun zero, tun one. They just don't conflict, conflict with the rest of the system. Uh, I can link these namespaces together using, you know, you get tunnels with two ends and one end can be outside the namespace and one end's in so they can communicate over, over a network in that way. So you can wire up lots of essentially virtual Crossover cables in between all your namespaces or between your processes. The question. So, do these, uh, if you look in slash sys or slash proc, do you see the namespace new of it in these subprocesses? Well, that's interesting. Um, back one slide to the mount thing. In actual fact, here we've still got the proc. Um, uh, the proc file system is mounted from outside the namespace. So, you, in, the question was does your proc system uh, uh, represent these changes, the, you know, the, the, the files inside proc? At this point, they don't because you, the, you've got access to a mount of proc from outside your namespace. So what you actually do is, um, the usual flow is you would uh, fork, set up a new namespace, fork a process into it, remount proc, and at that point you get a new view. And uh, there's a good example in a moment of that, so you'll see. Um, but this isn't, this isn't just the interfaces here. This is a whole view, a whole new instance, essentially, of the network stack. Uh, new routes, uh, you've got your own routes, your own firewalling. Um, so complete, complete control, no changes, and it change any other processes on the system, unless they're part of the same namespace, of course. <coughs> yeah, this is an example here. So process namespace. Um, I've got a bash shell here. I do echo dollar dollar, which gives me my uh, PID, uh, 19189. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to fork a bash shell with the hyphen hyphen <coughs> PID is, is the thing there. That's giving me a, its own process namespace. When I do echo dollar dollar now, my bash thinks it's PID one. Bash thinks it's in it. And if I do, a, and as you can, but this hyphen hyphen mount proc argument to unshare there is uh, automatically mounting my proc in re remounting my proc inside my namespace. So um, that's doing that work for you. Um, so yeah, look at my process list. I've only got bash and the PS, and bash is one, <laughs> and it has no idea about any of the processes. Can't access them. Can't send signals to them, even if it's running the same as the same user. Uh, the UTS namespace is just a pretty simple one, just lets you change the host name. So I'm firing up a bash shell here and changing the host name inside it. And you can see it's changed. They exit that shell back into the original system namespace, and it's still my, my laptop's uh, host name. Again, no other process was affected by any of those changes. And the user namespace, probably the most complicated, a little tricky to ex explain, but really, you're getting your own view of the UIDs and GIDs inside the system. Um, you get to provide a map um, of which IDs inside the namespace map to which IDs on the real system outside. Um, as far as the processes inside the namespace is concerned, it could be root. But in actual fact, <coughs> that's mapping to a non-privileged user. Uh, so in this, that's exactly what I'm doing in this case. Setting up a bash shell inside the user namespace. And then in another shell outside the namespace where it's got a bit, bit of control, um, I'm setting up this mapping. I won't explain that right now. But it's essentially mapping uh, root to 
process ID 1000. Um, and then back inside that original shell, you can see I'm now root. I haven't set up my GID, so my GIDs are still no group. And you might notice that's the example there. I'm running that as John at Dogen and not root because the things inside it are non-privileged. Uh, so you'll, again, this process thinks it's root, but it can't make privileged system calls and so on. So, uh, but it might be enough to run uh, package build environment, things like that. It's basically a super fake root system, you know. <laughs> uh, but you can map whole sections of UIDs around oh. things, so you don't, it's not just about root, you can map lots of things. Um, <clears throat> it's quite a recent one, is the user namespace. IPC namespace is for things like uh, your POSIX message queues, semaphores, shared memory segments, and so on. They're, they all become private to your set of processes. Uh, so that's, that's namespaces. Like I say, essentially uh, process virtualization. Hand in hand with that is a technology called C groups. Has anyone heard of C groups? Are you using C groups? A little bit there. So um, namespaces lets you isolate processes, but there's nothing really stopping any of those processes using all your RAM or using all your CPU or otherwise being dickheads. And that's what, uh, that's what C groups lets you control. Uh, it, it, it's for the most part, I mean, we've got the we've had resource limitation in the Linux kernel for years and years, all kinds of different ways. And nearly everyone will have used the nice command to change the price, CPU priority, and so on. So those things are kind of there already. The C groups just brings it all under one kind of unified interface where you can configure them all nicely, um, and where all the processes children inherit the same things, and they can't change their own priorities outside of it. So you're saying scheduling. Uh, details about processes, but you can throttle things as well, access to disk, access to network. It's got some accounting stuff built into it too. Um, so it's a separate technology, but it goes hand in hand. It's something you can need with isolation if you're gonna, if you're gonna do what Docker does. Um, so the combination of these two technologies is what we refer to as containerization. Oh, that's where this comes into it. Originally, C groups was called process containerization, I think, but it got, the name got changed because it's confusing. So when people talk about containers and containerization, it's just a combination of these two technologies, really, um, with a bit of orchestration, which is what Docker's tried to do. Um, processes running inside a namespace, controlled by some C groups, are, you know, are said to be um, being contained. They're running in a container. So it's hard to pin down, you know, when you've got a virtual machine running, it's, you've got a point of, a starting point, the kernel starts and you've got a whole new thing. It's a little difficult to talk about containers because they're just processes on the system with some, you know, memory structures in the kernel telling it not to see some things. So uh, we're going to call them containers, but it's not really a thing, if you see what I mean. It's like an emergent property of these other two uh, technologies. Um, so what cool stuff can we do with this? Um, we can improve security of ex existing systems. So be a great thing to go start using this straight away in your um, init scripts, your start scripts, or your system, system D scripts. And in fact, it's, it, a lot of this stuff's baked into system D now. It's taking advantage of all these things to help you isolate all your processes running, all your demons and things running on a system already. Um, and that's kind of what they were aimed at doing originally. Um, but what else can we do? And that's what LXC came along. So LXC, Linux containers, it is a bunch of helper scripts to set up these namespaces for you according to some config files. Um, and it's also got some things to download root, tables of root FSs and chroot into them essentially, or you know, using the mount, mount thing. So essentially you get virtual machines, you get a new init process, um, bash shell, cron and that thing, all inside a little tree running inside its own namespace. So as far as it's concerned, it's its own virtual system but it's actually running, it's still sharing a kernel with you. Um, so it's very lightweight virtualization is the idea. Um, LXC handles configuring the networking for you too. So sort of those tunnels that we were talking about and it runs a little DHCP server for you, I think, and allocates IPs and things. So it just makes using namespaces and C groups kind of simple for this kind of thing. Um, we've had LXC for quite a long time now. Uh, predates Docker and in fact, Docker made use of LXC in the early days, but it's, it's moved on now. So what did Docker add to LXC? What does it have that LXC doesn't, other than a better logo? Um, the, what makes it different? So Docker is a container management system uh, similar to LXC. It's, it's actually a daemon that runs, so it's, it's, it can do a bit more. It's more involved. Um, 
but it's basically got the same support for namespaces and C groups, kind of does the same stuff, although uh, ironically, we have taken a step back. LXC lets you do the process uh, namespace, uh, the user namespace stuff, so your processes are actually not, don't have to run as root, whereas that's not the case with Docker. If you've got root inside a Docker container, you're real root on the system. But they're working on fixing that. So a bit of a step back. But um, The other thing is Docker is application-centric as opposed to LXC, which is um, more... Uh, whole OS virtualization centric. So LXC, you don't have to, but LXC is pretty much aimed. You can see it. It's the path of least resistance is running a, a little virtual machine with a cron daemon and, and in it and so on and so forth. Docker just wants to start your app as process one. Um, no, no system, no larger system virtualization. Um, Docker has images which is just a nice big registry and lots of convenient commands for uh, sh downloading pre-made images or environments to run your apps in, but also creating your own and sharing them. Um, so, it's, I mean, it's not really anything special, but it really is what has made Docker what it is and why LXC hasn't. I mean, it, building a virtual machine with LXC took quite a long time for me to figure out, and with Docker, it was literally just installed a package and a couple of commands. It was, it was a bit too much magic, but it was, it was impressive. You can see why it's popular and why it's working. It's empowering people. Um, it's got versioning built in as Docker for these images. They're reusable. Like I say, you can, you can reuse them yourself. You can share them with other people. It's got a copy on write system built in, um, which makes things really fast. You've got a real feel of speed with it. It's, it's going so far from virtualization of spawning a few virtual machines and interacting with them. It's really like just spawning some processes and interacting with them, but it's your whole app environment. It's quite impressive. Um, and uh, admittedly, it does have a nice logo, but um, LXC has got a new logo now. So. <laughs> Bit late though, LXC. <laughs> um, so here's an example. Can you can you everyone see this this text? Anyone not? Okay, good. Um, this is an example. I've already installed Docker on this system here. Uh, it, it is just one package I can install, and a few dependencies. It's nothing too too um, heavy duty. Um, and there's a Docker daemon running. So this is the CLI command I'm running. Docker run Ubuntu. This is a plain villain machine. It connects to a centralized registry, looks up the Ubuntu tag that I've given it there, pulls down the image um, over HTTP, and runs a bash prop, um, a, runs a bash process in there straight away. Uh, so it knew how to find the image that I was referring to, and the image itself knew how to run itself, which is in this case a bash prompt. Uh, this obviously looks a lot like what I was saying there. Like, see, it looks like. Full OS virtualization, but it's not. The, by Ubuntu, we mean just an, a very bare bones Ubuntu uh, skeleton file system. So you know, you see libraries, a bash prompt, and a few other bits and bobs. There's no init scripts. There's no other demons. You can see here, you know, just bash and ps when I run the run the, run the ps process list there. Uh, so these images that I refer to, the LXC does have images that you can download these and kind of, I think you can share, but it's not really, the sharing's not built into LXC, but it can download tarballs of pre-built um, uh, environments that you can run in. And the big three, you know, two or 300 meg tarballs or whatever. And, and every time you start a new virtual machine, it has to copy one of those around and so on and so forth. Uh, Docker's gone to the work of trying to <coughs> reduce the uh, amount of data that's having to be moved around. So it splits all your images into layers and overlays them at runtime. Uh, so oh, you're only having to download or share your changes to images. So in this case, the Ubuntu image, even though it's just a very basic image, <coughs> it's already these, these where it says here, download, complete, download, complete, download, complete. Those IDs there are image uh, layer IDs. So my image is called Ubuntu, and it's made up of those five layers, or whatever, there's six layers. And it downloads all those. I've, I'm looking in the background here on the file system. And you can see they're just unpacked into directories. One of them's 209 meg, so that's presumably the bulk of the, uh, of the Ubuntu installation. But then there's a few other ones, a couple of five meg ones here and there, and they're obviously adding some little bits, a uh, little customization. Have we got a question here? Um, with the Docker images, I, I, if you update the base image, does that invalidate all the other layers? Um, what, it depends what you're doing. So what you've got is, I'm going to get to. I'm actually going to get to that in a moment. Actually, it will it will cover that. Um, so, let me think. I've got a diagram here. Um, so those 
those layers that were, that were downloaded are downloaded to disk into directories for each of those layers. Some of them have lots of files in, some of them less files in. When I run a container, which is you know, when I ran that Ubuntu thing with bash and it formed a bash, what it does is it hard links all those layers together, or technically I think that's done when, when they're downloaded, so it's cached for later. So all those layers are all, each layer is stacked on top of the previous layer, and the previous layer is hard linked in. Um, so the very top layer, that D0955F, so on, um, when you go into that directory on the file system, you know, if you're looking in the background there, you, it looks like the, the fully formed image, but in actual fact it's only five meg because it's lots of hard links to all the previous ones. So it hard links all that together into kind of one layer, and then it uses um, overlay FS to stick a copy on right layer on top, which is what your container runs in. Anyone heard of overlay FS or AUFS? Whenever the container writes or reads any files to this image, so you would just run this container. Instead of it changing these hard links here or any of these files on this image, it actually copies them up from the, if you, know, if you modify one, it copies them up from this stack into a new layer at the top and then lets you modify it up there. And any new files you create go in that new layer at the top. So this image is read-only. It's never changed by your container, uh, which means you've got a nice, clear track of what's changed and and systems that are sharing the same images can't affect each other in any way. Again, there's nothing that LXC couldn't do. LXC could definitely um, use OLAFS. It's just a standard uh, um, uh, overlay file system. But it's the fact that Docker brought all this together is what, is what makes it valuable. Um, so I started that container. If we just go back a couple. When I started, I did Docker run Ubuntu. It, it downloaded the image and started a bash shell. If you look at the host name, A65EE08, that's, a, that's an ID that was assigned to my container. My container over here, I can do docker diff and that ID there, I've, I've actually exited the container now, but it's left the changes behind, the, the, the changes layer. And if I do docker diff, it looks in the background and finds and displays the differences between the image I downloaded, which was called Ubuntu, <coughs> and the new container layer that I started. Now, you saw I didn't actually change anything, but obviously Bash does. Bash is, updated or appended to the bash history file. It looks a little bit like, I don't know what C is, I think it's created the root directory, which is off, but there you are. So there are differences there with that image. And if you look, again, if I peek in the background, that ID is in there in the overlay directory and it's just got the bash history file in there. Um, we can use this to make our own images. So I'm going to run uh, bash in the Ubuntu image. I'm going to app get update, app get install the cow say command, which is a command that draws an ASCII picture of a cow. Um, and makes it say things you want in a speech bubble. Uh, very web 2.0. Um, it's web scale, don't worry, it goes pretty, it runs, <laughs> runs very fast. No, no, we're going to make it, yeah, we're going to make it clusterable with uh, MongoDB. That'll be the next step. <laughs> um, so now I've, at this point, just before I run exit, I've got a container which has got the Ubuntu image all hard linked together and then an overlay of just a cow say binary installed and presumably some metadata that apt gets a, has messed my file system up with. I can exit that container and it's no longer running, but it's still got the overlay on disk. And I can tell Docker to commit that container. You see that ID is the same as the host name that was inside the container. When Docker does that commit, it basically uh, takes the changes that I made since that image in that container and turns it into an a new image for me. And the new image is just the Cowsay binary, all those kind of changes, plus uh, some metadata referencing the Ubuntu image. So now my Cowsay image is only you know, whatever it is, the Cowsay binary is a couple of meg in total with the metadata and stuff. Um, and I can tag that image that it's created, 5891CA, whatever, and give it a nice name and call it Cowsay. Uh, anyone who's familiar with Git is probably starting to see that this is, you know, you can see what's going on here a little bit. Tags are just uh, uh, pointers to uh, image IDs, uh, just in the same way that tags in Git are uh, pointers to uh, commit IDs in Git. So now if I do docker images, cowsay, it shows that I've got, actually got a, an image called cowsay. That's the image ID, it was created four minutes ago. And now I can, I can do docker run cowsay instead of docker run Ubuntu. <coughs> Tell it the command I want to run inside the container and the arguments to it, and it runs cowsay, go docker. Uh, so instead of having to run uh, the uh, Ubuntu image every time and install cowsay and run cowsay, uh, I now have an image that has all that prep done and I can just execute it. Uh, I can share it with people too, all kind of built in. So I can 
Docker save the, the CAUSE image into a tarball. If I look at the, the tarball there, it's just got these layers in here. I think in this case, the whole thing's actually two or 300 meg. It, it does include the layers of the Ubuntu image because that's just how the uh, Docker save works. And I can move that tarball around onto another Docker system and do, do Docker load, and uh, at which point that I've got that image on that system, I can run it, and it should run in exactly the same way as it, as it is, the same bits uh, as it was on this system. It should run in the same way. Um, so the, uh, you might be thinking this is a bit, it's not very, it's a convenient way to make images, but it's not, it's not reproducible. It's not easily scriptable. The Docker's ahead of us. So a better way to make images is using a Docker file, which is basically like a make file, but for container images, container, container file systems. Um, so this is the Docker file equivalent of what I just did with a cow, say, example. I tell, uh, I tell it to from Ubuntu, so it's going to start with the Ubuntu tag. I'm, I'm going to tell it to run app get update and app get install cowse, and they get when you do a build, they get run inside the container, and it keeps track of the changes. And then in this case, I'm specifying an environment variable called message, and I'm defaulting it to nothing to say, and I'm telling in the Docker file, I'm <coughs> defining the cowse command, I mean a little bit of shell script there, and giving it the environment message there. So what's happened here is this is this is really where the key where it comes to being Docker becoming uh, application centric rather than OS centric. Not only have I described how to set up the environment for my app to run in, I've also I've also described how my app should be run and how it can be configured via an environment variable called message. So now if I build an image from this, that when that image moves around it not only brings the app with it, but it also brings instructions of how to run the app. Obviously, this could be a shell script inside uh, the image that I put in there that's far more uh, in detail. You got a question? I take it the difference between one and the command is this that command was shell interpretation? Well, actually, no, there's quite a big difference, and I'm going to explain it just now, if you can see this anyway. Um, those run commands get run during build time. So, in this case, I've got a directory called cowse with a Docker file in it, which you just saw there, you know, with the from Ubuntu and install, it tells it to run app get update and so on and so forth. When I do docker build, dot the current directory, finds that docker file, as you can see, it goes through the steps here. Step zero from Ubuntu, that's the image ID of the Ubuntu uh, image. <coughs> it runs app get update and it runs that command inside a container with a new container layer for us. Uh, and then it runs the cow say in that same <laughs> container. Well, technically, it's actually creating a new container every time here and keeping track of every single change, but it's a bit outside the scope here. So they're being run at build time. As you can see here, it installs the cowse command. It, it's basically doing nothing with the um, env and the cmd statements. It's just noting them and putting them inside the metadata for the image. And then it spits out at the bottom, it spits out a image ID that I can, that's the result of that Docker file build. So now I've got an image 68FCF7C. <coughs> And if I just do docker run on you know, that image ID, it just runs cowse with nothing to say. I didn't have to tell it how to run cowse. I just run it and it, it knows how to run itself, if you see what I mean. And I've exposed a nice standard interface for configuring it via the uh, message environment variable. So I've done message equals hello world there. And it's gone from the default to actually executing it there. You see? Um, so. If you want to share that with the world in a more convenient fashion than that big tarball, Docker's got, a, a, as I mentioned earlier, a centralized image repository that, that you can register with and you can push images to. Because all this so far, we've been pulling images from. They're public. If you want to push your own, you register and you can get your own repositories. Um, so I do Docker tag. Uh, I'm going to tag that image with the cowse in there as my repository, John L slash cowse, I'm going to call it. It's just a, just a name I can choose. John L is my username on the repository. Uh, Docker push John L Kause and pushes that up to the repository. As you can see, image already pushed, Im image already pushed. These are all the layers of the Ubuntu part. So the first uh, five there will be the layers of the Ubuntu image. And they're already on the, on the repository because we got from them from there earlier, right? We didn't have to push 200 meg. We only had to push the next four layers, which are my Kause image. Um, if, you've been, if you've been paying very, very close attention, the reason the Kause image has four layers instead of one is that it created a new layer for every one of those run commands that we did. So it created a layer when I did app get update, and I created a layer when I did app get install. And the idea is that if I 
later decide to install cow say and another command and I change just that line of the docker file and I do a push I, the apt get update changes are already on the registry I only have to change I only have to push the changes since then but it's going a bit basically it goes to great lengths to avoid pushing too much data around makes things uh, nice and fast is the aim uh, but now anyone in the world can pull my cow say image this is on another system this is on my laptop so I just do docker pull John L slash cow say pulls it I didn't I obviously didn't have the Ubuntu image already so I had to download all the Ubuntu layers and then my cow say layers and then when I run it I get cow say the exact same bits that I had on my other system um, and it runs in exactly the same way um, someone did ask whether if you change the if someone up updates the Ubuntu image at any point does it force my image to be rebuilt in any way um, no, because when I did from Ubuntu, at build time, that was translated into an ID, and the ID was used. And when someone updates the Ubuntu image, it'll get a new ID, because the, the word Ubuntu is just a tag that's pointing to a commit ID. So my Kausa image is the binary result of the build, and it will be, always be the same case everywhere, and it'll share only um, e exact versions of those layers. Any question? So that's that's true, yeah. So um, whilst my image won't change, will next time I run Docker build will that change? And that is true. Um, but you have um, namespace tags, so you can have Ubuntu colon fourteen oh four or Ubuntu colon trusty lucid and so on and so forth. Um, It'll be nice and great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and on, on top of that, you can put the whole committee of the idea in there if you want, and it'll never change. Um, question? Does Docker have the equivalent of Git rebase to actually put it into, uh, into a new uh, ID? So if the Ubuntu is updated, then you want to use the new ID, and you know there are no abilities. Can you do that automatically? Hmm, I'm not sure. Uh, the format would definitely allow it. You you could literally untab all the image and edit just some JSON in there, and you could change the commit ID. Um, so it, it should be doable. I don't. I've not seen any commands that do it. It might be in the future. They do. They go to some length to emulate Git, but in lots of other ways they they don't. So I, I'm not quite sure what they're going for. It wants to be Git esque. So. I just reminding you. Would you say Docker file is the best way to build Docker containers completely, or would you use something like Packer, which can go to multiple targets? Um. I only found a packer the other day, actually. Um, depends what you're doing. Uh, depends what you're targeting. And I've, th there are some other standards cropping up other than Docker, and they're, they're interesting, and I don't know. I've got a little slide at the end about the future of Docker, so I might, might just cover that in there. Um, so, OK, it's not hard to run Kausay. You don't really need to make a whole image and share it with the whole world just so they can run Kausay. They can all like, get install it or whatever. Um, so, but what about something that's a little bit more complicated, like MySQL? So there's a MySQL uh, Docker image. Um, someone's built that for me already. They've, they've written their own Docker file. They've built the binary and pushed it to the repository. I can just do Docker run MySQL. And in the metadata, it tells you a little bit. You can inspect the metadata. It tells you about the environment variables that it's going to expect. Um, and one of them is MySQL root password. So in this case, when I run that the first time, it starts MySQL, initializes the InnoDB data files inside the container, and sets the root password, then runs MySQL. Um, there are, as, as, as we said with Ubuntu, there are versions for every single version of MySQL, and then they're all kept like that. Where does all your data go? Ah, <laughs> as it says here, raises two questions, one of which has been raised right there. <laughs> um, two questions, networking, how do I speak to this MySQL, and two, persistent data, because if I stop running this container, where will my data go? Um, we don't want to have to, every time we shut down a MySQL container, commit it, but push it to the repository or something. That's, that's not really how it's going to work. So networking. Every single time you run a, I'm running out of time a little bit, so I'll have to make, keep get this going quick. Um, the, every time you run a Docker container, it gets given a new IP address by the Docker daemon, so it's just a little DHCP type thing. So I've, look here, I've run the uh, Ubuntu thing several times and just looked at the IP address, and there's four different IP addresses each time. So if I was running a MySQL server and every time I ran it, the IP change, that's going to make things like a little difficult. So um, Docker wants to help you with that. It wants to help you with this kind of service discovery. Um, images expose what ports, uh, image 
has other metadata. I didn't put it in that Docker file, but you can describe what ports your container exposes. So in, in this case, my, the MySQL Docker file will have, I think it's expose 3306. So that tells Docker that when this container runs, it'll be listening on port 3306, and it's a service to be expected to be shared with other containers or the outside world. So it's just mostly just metadata there. Um, you, when you run the container, can then choose to share that externally on your host or share those ports with other containers, specifically Docker handles, setting up all the firewalling between them. So you can have two uh, Docker containers. You can say, this one's running 3306, this one's connected to it. It's like a link. You just say link, and it kind of does the work to link those up. Sets all the firewall rules up for you. Um, goes a bit further, though. That You know how I set the root password there in the, uh, in the environment variable? It'll share that environment variable with the other container that you say that you're having a link with, ignoring the fact that it's root for now. <laughs> There's a lot of ignoring the fact that it's insecure <laughs> in the Docker world. Um, <clears throat> so I'm running a new container called MySQL client that I prepared earlier. It's just got the MySQL binary installed on there, um, not the server, just the client. And I'm linking in my, my, my running MySQL server container and giving it a name of MySQL server. And uh, Docker does the work of going and finding the environment variables from that, which hit the root password, and exposes them in the new container that I'm executing. So uh, as an example here, I'm just grepping the environment for the word MySQL. And you can see it's telling me the version of the MySQL container I'm connected to, uh, the password, the IP address of it, which again will change every time the container chain, uh, is run. So I can rig up my MySQL client to connect to, you know, using those environment variables. Uh, to, auth to connect and authenticate. Uh, you might notice that I'm using minus H MySQL server here and not the environment variable because Docker's also writing some host file stuff for me to, to do that link. It's a bit shonky, I must admit. <laughs> but if you, if you look at it in terms of a, a development <coughs> environment, it's ideal. I can just bring up uh, my MySQL server, my Redis server, uh, several app servers, and a load balancer um, and go you know, link them all together. And there's some tools that can orchestrate that. And They'll all be given new IP addresses and new ports, and they'll all, all the file rules will all be set up, and they'll all be told about each other's passwords and IP addresses, and you better run it and test it, and then you better tear it all down and do it again if you like. Um, let's have a look. Persistent storage. How, how much time have we got? Um, uh, 20 minutes. All right, I'll plenty there. Um, I'll talk slower. Uh, actually, we'll get some water. So with persistent storage, we can specify, when we run a container, we can specify what are called volumes, which are essentially just a directory on the host that you're going to bind mount into the container so that it can access it. So in this case, uh, on my host, I'm creating a directory called MySQL data. I'm running Docker. I'm running a MySQL server Docker. I'm giving it a root password. But I'm also doing minus V, and I'm saying home call MySQL data. That's the directory on the host. Colon slash valid MySQL, which is the directory inside the container. And it'll map that directory, which is currently empty, into valid MySQL inside the container. The container starts up, uh, and it's been scripted. The way it's been designed is to make sure to check to see if that's empty and needs initializing, which in this case it is. So it does all the InnoDB initialization, sets it up, sets the root password. But at this point, it's not, that data is not inside the container anymore. It's not in that container layer. It's all being written to the MySQL directory uh, data, MySQL data mount on my host. So as you can see here, I can ls MySQL data now, and it's got all the kind of stuff that uh, MySQL creates when it starts up. Um, you can mount, you can do those volume mounts. You can mount the same directory on your host into multiple containers. Um, not so useful if you're going to run multiple MySQL servers. Uh, but what's really interesting is you can mount them read-only. So I could, for example, if I wanted to run a, a backup process that's going to back up my MySQL data directory, uh, instead of running the backup process inside the MySQL container, I would run the backup process in a new container that has only a read-only mount of the MySQL valid MySQL directory. Uh, and also doesn't even need the MySQL binaries and things. So it could just be a Python script or whatever. Um, I'm not so sure I'd be running MySQL you know, uh, inside Docker like this. Uh, 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 what we're doing at Brightbox is we're using this mostly for our, our developers to be able to describe um, the environment in which this should run. And what we're doing is we, in production, we've got real well, virtual machines that the apps are being deployed onto. 
and then we make Docker files that describe them really closely, so the exact version of Ubuntu and all the same libraries and so on. So the developers can run uh, all this stuff um, in, uh, in an environment that's almost identical to production, but isn't the exact same bytes. But then the test uh, we've got on a, a, a continuous integration server checks all the code out and can run all the tests in the exact same environment. And it's, you know, it's kind of the ops jobs just to make sure that the Docker files describe the production environment correctly. We haven't gone the full step of like taking those containers and running them in production yet. Um, we're too frightened. <laughs> um, but we'll get there uh, with some apps. But it in, with, I, I can't see where we're going to run our MySQL systems inside, inside these. I just don't think the, the kind of uh, orchestration is there. Um, but, you know, so Docker's aiming to be the unit of deployment. Uh, you deploy your app into a Docker image instead of onto your servers, and then you deploy your image wherever Docker can run. Uh, it's got a standard interface to configure it and a standard interface to execute it, uh, and it should be the exact same environment on dev and on testing and uh, any kind of uh, QA that you're running and production is the aim. <laughs> so that... That's what it's aiming to be. And like I say, we're not quite there yet. And I'm, I'm not quite sure. It's already solved a lot of our problems, allowing us to um, make these environments that match very closely to our virtualized system, but are a lot easier for the devs to uh, spawn up. Because we, we've got, we haven't quite got a MongoDB cluster, but we've got message queues and all kinds of things like that. Um, and it's a lot easier for them to just kick those things up and test them. Um, it actually started, it didn't start with the devs, it started in the middle of the test. Um, they, we, we run Jenkins and he wants to run the test suites and it was getting more and more difficult to run things in all the different versions of Ruby with all the different versions of the libraries for Ubuntu and so on. So we actually had several Docker files, docker.lucid.ruby19, docker.trusty.ruby19, docker.trusty.ruby2 and so on. And the, the CI server just uh, builds an image for every one of those and runs the test suite inside it. Uh, Jenkins can build virtual machines and bootstrap them and set them up and run them in that way. And we are a cloud provider. We have an API for all this, and we can do it. But just Docker is just so much faster um, and can do pretty much all the work there. As to whether I'd want to make it my, uh, a multi-tenancy thing, uh, that's really not on the cards right now. Um, if you think about your the attack surface when you're running process inside a virtual machine, your attack surface is the, the the, the, the thin layer of uh, KVM, and you've got a lot of hardware protection in there too. Um, still on tax service, but um, still bigger than uh, Zen's. But with containers, your attack service is all the system calls of the kernel. You're sharing the same kernel as all the other processes. Uh, in fact, a lot of people are using Docker like, oh, this is a really smart way to run untrusted code. I can just pull uh, repositories off the internet and run untrusted stuff and it'll protect me. And, and it really doesn't, especially as Docker is running as root and it, and it will run processes as privileged root users inside containers, which isn't as bad as it sounds, but isn't as good as people think. <laughs> Got a question? Try echoing R to the rock, uh, sysrack, uh, your laptop or your Docker system reboots quite unexpectedly. From inside a container. Yes. Oh, really? Even though, even though uh, it's mounting, well, even though it's mounting a new proc. So the use of it until you start locking down SE Linux. Oh right, right, yeah, uh, yeah. In combination with SE Linux, SE Linux is getting a bit better, but Docker doesn't yet. I think, I think it's just getting there. Uh, like you use seccomp and things like that, but it's really not. I think it adds a lot. It adds a lot of isolation that you might not otherwise have on multiple processes on a system, but you're losing a hell of a lot going from a proper virtualized system. Another question? I was going to say, <clears throat> following on the temp point there, can you, uh, can you get it to drop the capabilities it doesn't need for the inside Docker? So, uh, I don't know, like maybe for the ability to, to use magic to fuck you and things like that. There are different caps for, for those that you want. Well, yeah, that's the thing. If you're making your own containers, um, what you should do is when you run CowSe, you would actually use some other. You either have CowSe drop its own privileges, or you would run a system that um, there's several things, also Dan Bernstein tools that will like, happily drop all your privileges and then run CowSe, mm -hmm. and that's what you should be doing. And that can yeah, make. I don't know why, why Docker can't do that for you? Um, really, uh, I just started working on it. The trouble is that uh, it's not entirely clear. From a standard point of view, which privileges which you need to drop, yeah. which you should go back and drop. Yeah. You look at something like Solaris, there's a, uh -huh. it's actually mapped completely which ones you keep and which ones you drop, but they haven't quite done all the exploration, mm -hmm. which
you can see, I mean, this is an example of why Docker's, Docker's popular. You can see uh, on all the pull request discussions on, on, on GitHub, whenever anyone suggests, oh, here's a thing to add user mapping or add improved security, they, they don't just merge it. There's a lot of discussion about how is this going to look to the user and how is the user going to interact with this. Um, and I mean, I think they got a lot of the way they did because they took a step back and gave up on some of the security bits because it made things easier. But uh, actually, my next slide kind of mentions this. You know, the future of Docker, Red Hat's heavily on board with this now, and they <laughs> don't want to be too mean, but it kind of means we've got some proper engineers looking at it now. You know? <laughs> so you know, there's a, there's, there is a, um, at least one engineer from. Um, Red Hat, who runs a blog about the security <coughs> on it, and, that, and they've been working v really strongly on how to improve the security. They stop it, stop it running things of privileges, because you've got the you've got the capabilities in the namespace stuff to to drop a lot of. Not even have these privileges, it doesn't even have to run as root. So it's there, it can do it. Uh, it's just a matter of the the effort to implement it and the how to figure out how to make it work in a way that do, you don't start sacrificing all of these uh, the things that make it fast and lightweight. You know. Which is why, again, I'd be happy to drop privilege inside my container, inside my command, you know, all that kind of stuff. But as someone else giving me a Docker file to run who I don't trust or, or a, a, a tarball to run, you'd have to trust that they're doing that and not doing something nefarious with the uh, root privileges. And that, that's not something you do. So I don't think it's something I'd be doing for quite a while in a multi-tenancy way. Um, but we might get there on production, but I'm still going to be running MySQL servers and Postgres servers. Uh, I mean, there's still people who don't believe that we run MySQL and Postgres servers on virtual systems. So uh, maybe I'm just, the, I'm this generation's version of those people who still don't know how I'm not running MySQL on real hardware. I'm like, you're running MySQL in containers. What? Another question? Um, the, the, a lot of the stuff you see with Docker, and particularly with the data containers, is you're moving content from your host system into your containers. I mean, that works fine as a sort of development system, but how do you do that in real production systems? Is it back to being a sysadmin problem of um, making sure your data is available on multiple servers and replicated and backed up? And how do you, it's more sort of how do you spread Docker beyond a single host in an organized fashion? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've played with uh, open, uh, you know, you suddenly realize there's things you've just seen written down you never said. I think it's Open Deis or Open Deis. It's a platform as a service that's using Docker um, as its unit of deployment, and and this is where I think the future of Docker is going. It's a, the Docker container is very interesting, and the daemon's got some good ideas, and he's definitely going in the right direction. But um, uh, it doesn't solve all of your problems. Uh, it certainly doesn't solve your high availability problems. But even as soon as you have two hosts and you want to connect two containers across two hosts. The, the Docker doesn't really do that. Um, well, so, uh, it's, yeah. it's, so it's not that I hadn't figured it out from the documentation. It's, it, it, it's more difficult than it appears. Yeah. Well, what OpenDS is doing is, uh, has anyone heard of Ceph? Yeah. Replicated file, a highly available file system, co make, keep copies of your, of your uh, it's a, basically a POSIX file system. It will replicate it across multiple places. Servers can die. and it'll, What OpenDS does is it brings Docker together uh, as a, has anyone heard of Heroku? A couple of people, so Heroku is a platform for deploying apps, which kind of inspired Docker in a lot of ways. Um, it's an open source version of that. And what it does is it uh, sets up a Ceph cluster inside containers. So uh, you'll have your minimum is three um, uh, Docker nodes, and each one of them has to be running several containers that are just uh, the Ceph file system. And then you can you store your data on that and it's replicated across multiple hosts that are running Docker but in containers. You can kill a node and data gets re-replicated and moved around. So, but the idea of running MySQL in a container stored onto Ceph, which is also in a container, which is on some virtual machines, and I don't know. It'd be fun for, if you've got like, if you've got a hundred little blogs or something maybe, uh, or a hundred little apps, I'm finding it quite interesting in that way, but I don't think I trust it with anything serious just yet. But it's, you can see where it's going. I Yeah, in fact, a lot of these demos are run on Core OS. So again, I don't know quite how. I've got a few more minutes. Mm, Ten minutes. Cool. All right. Well, um, so how to run Docker is probably a good one. So you can uh, you can install it on most modern Ubuntu's and just it runs starts the daemon and you can start interacting with it. But there is the whole idea is that you're supposed to be running everything in containers, and the, you know you can see how it starts to lend itself to be that your host should be very thin, and ideally have 
nothing on there that you care about and your host can go away just as easily as your containers can go away. Um, so there's some distros cropping up that are trying to help you provide that kind of scenario. So one of them is CoreOS and it's a Linux distro, just really thin. It uses similar ideas to uh, Chrome OS. So I think it's got transactional uh, kind of atomic system updates. Um, and it, it basically just boots up and has Docker, not really anything else at all. You can SSH into it and run Docker commands. Um, uh, well, as far as the Linux distro is concerned, but then it comes with a whole bunch of other uh, stuff in its ecosystem for clustering multiple core OS nodes together using fancy Paxos key value stores and things. So you can start to look, start to see where they're going in terms of orchestrating these containers and moving them when things fail and keeping track of the firewall rules and stuff. It's, again, it's not there. It's, it's going in that direction. That's what core OS does. Um, I don't know about Kubernetes and Kubernetes. Right, right. So I think I'm not certain about that one, but that the old, <laughs> you know, the olden days, you know, six months ago, <laughs> um, you would usually. I think a lot of the old, the, the uh, Google's app, I forget what it's called, app app engine things. You write your applications uh, to their API, um, and then they can scale it and run it in lots of different places. Uh, and what's happening now is these platforms are starting to add support for Docker. So instead of you having to write your application to their API and, and you give them a Docker container and say, run that as many times as I need it and, you know, and bill me for it. Uh, or don't, since they're all free for some reason. Kubernetes is sort of analogous to Flink in the core OS world and Mesos the Apache project. OK, right, yeah. Of right, Mesos, yeah. Across, uh, machines. Yeah, so Mesos, yeah. That, so uh, Apache Mesos project, again, was like, you'd have a, the idea is you have loads and loads of nodes and you'd want to run an app on it and you give it to it and it would handle spread it, spreading your app across all these things. Is that me? No. <laughs> um, so uh, you would write your app to the Mesos API. Uh, it supported Java and, and Python and a few other things, but you had to write it for that. And now, and now that's added support for, con for Docker containers, so you just write a container and give it to it, and it'll handle running it across all your different servers. So you can start to see the future of Docker, I think at its core, the Docker image idea is certainly there. Uh, is going to persist, um, but you know it brings it brings the virtualization. I think easy portability, speed, and control, and you know their concepts aren't going to go any. They're not going to go away. Uh, Docker's just set a new bar, and I think. I mean, I'd like to see new ways of interacting with KVM and Zen and other virtualizations, full virtualization systems that start to approximate what Docker's doing. There's a lot of limitations of te technologies where we won't be able to, but they won't certainly won't be as quick. Um, but to be a, you know, the fact that with Docker we can just drop files inside running virtual machines and things is hard work, but it's not out of, out of the question. So, um, and there's also a whole bunch of new Docker style container standards cropping up. Everyone's seeing where the flaws are in Docker now, and they want to start from the ground up, and they're all competing a little bit. But Docker's like everyone knows what Docker is, and I bet I bet only two of you know what Rocket is. So. Uh, so that's, that's the thing, but it, it doesn't mean that they might borrow each off each other, one might come out, but the idea is they've got the same concept. Um, so I think the concept's here to stay. I don't know where Docker will be quite in two years. It's only two years old, which is pretty crazy. Um, it's already in officially supported, I think, in CentOS 7. Uh, so an enterprise Linux distro you know, officially supports. It's like, what? <laughs> I've invested a lot of time and effort in getting Vader and Puppet basically to be working and that's my sort of deployment dev environment stuff. Is there a kind of killer feature that would make it worth expending the same amount of effort to use Puppet? Um, <coughs> we're in the same boat. We've got Puppet managers all of our systems. Um, uh, so it's tricky. The fact that you can, there's no, nothing stopping you running Puppet inside, you know, with, with those run commands at build time during your... Uh, Docker builds, it doesn't mean you have to move away from things like Chef and Puppet. Um, it might just be that instead of running it on a system, a build, uh, 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 when you boot the system, you're running it at build time for the image with Puppet and making an image and then using the image. Um, I mean, you, might, you may have noticed, anyone who's followed along over the last uh, however many, well, 10 years or something, everyone was writing little shell scripts to bootstrap their servers and install things and echo config files and stuff. And then, um, if I rewrite history somewhat, Puppet came along and fixed all that, ignoring CF Engine there. Um, 
And then everyone was like, yeah, yeah, we need to define these things properly and do things right. And then Docker's come along and they're like, put it all back in shell scripts again, but we'll do it at build time so you'll feel okay about it. Um, so it feels a bit like we've gone a bit full circle and I don't know where we're going with that. For some reason, I like writing shell scripts. I like building systems with shell scripts now with Docker and I didn't used to like it and that's why I use Puppet. And there's something about the fact that it feels like that's actually just the source code now and it's reproducible rather than it was always just this weird thing and I didn't know where it was. It all goes in Git and gets run. I don't know about Puppet, but certainly there's a Chef containers, which is a way of using Chef to build your Docker container, um, which is it's an interesting one because uh, the Chef people weren't entirely sure that they wanted that, but they had a number of customers asking for it, so they built it and shared it because that's what Chef does. Mm. Um, uh, and, and so there is there is stuff like that, and I suspect that uh, you know it's another thing. <laughs> and another thing is that, that CoreOS are sort of starting looking at Docker and seeing sort of little issues with Docker like and security and a few. So they've actually devised a specification called Axie, um, and a <coughs> reference implementation which they call Rocket, which is yeah. using the same sort of idea, but it's it's much more geared towards an application rather you know, and, and for that and software. Whereas Docker sort of you know, it's meant to just run one application, but it builds it from a kind of half OS and things, whereas AppSea is really thinking about it and has a lot more of an interface to be able to, you know, build, think about the sharing and security and what have you. So yeah. that's still another good project to watch. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Docker's got quite a bit of funding and they're making a big fuss about this being stable and reliable, and it is in many ways, but um, <laughs> at the end of the day, it's just two years old and really, you know, we're at the peak, peak hype at the moment and everything's going a bit crazy and we're, but everyone's just learning how to use these things and, uh, and I think there's still a long way to go. So uh, it's an, I think it's an interesting time. It, it, it's certainly easy to get up and running with these things, which is good, but that could be the case all along. But. I think, uh, one more question. Okay. I was going to say, I don't know about a lot, is you mentioned it uses overlay FS. Um, is that a fuse file system or a first class file system? What's the performance like with that? It's a first class file system. The performance. Um, even if you think about what it has to do when you edit a file, if you make a change to a file, it has to make a copy of that file up up to the new layer, so you can see how writing to large files is going to be slow. So you modify write cycle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, the performance isn't going to be as good as a native one for sure. Um, they, they, they used to use there was a they actually had a VetraFS driver originally, so it was all there was no overlay FS. VetraFS would handle doing the copy on write. At the, obviously, it does it at the block level too. So. Shh, should be a load faster, but um, Core OS, I think, were the main um, implementation of that, or the main deployment of that, and they've had lots of problems with BetterFS, so they've moved back to EXT and OverlayFS now. <coughs> we might come back full circle back to BetterFS when BetterFS is a little closer to being uh, ready. Yeah, better, a better FS. <laughs> okay, um, thank you very much, John. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>